Thomas. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for the invite. Um, yeah, it's, um, so just a little short background about uh, who I am and the company I work for. Um, I have a background in computer science and multimedia design, so it's a little bit of an odd combination, um, although these days it's, I suppose it's getting more common. Um, the company I work for is called Fusion.io. We, uh, we produce software and hardware for very large data centers. As a matter of fact, we do run inside Facebook. A large part of what you view will be running on our stuff. Uh, so, um, so we have a lot of exposure to this new big data world. Um, my background from computer science is primarily in making computers run really, really fast, uh, doing some pretty crazy stuff. So just, I'm just curious, just by showing up of hands, how many here consider themselves to have a, a computer-type background, computer science background? It's about half the audience. Okay. So big data is, of course, the new big thing. Um, there is a lot of data out there. We've known that for a long time. If this was a traditional big data presentation, I would start by telling you how much there is. It's a lot. Um, we know it's growing. And there's an entire industry that live very well on giving things that grow new names, even though they look very much like the old things. So we call it big data because this is, uh, it's bigger than we normally manage it. Uh, for those of you who uh, have worked with things like data warehousing, business intelligence, data visualization before, this is not a new field. It's just a lot bigger than it used to be, which is great news for people in that industry. Uh, but a lot of the disciplines that apply in the old data warehousing, business intelligence, data visualization space, apply equally to big data. Big data is just a little bit more unforgiving of mistakes, which makes it quite interesting. Um, what we do know about big data is that it's growing faster than humanity is. So humanity is fundamentally not scaling very well anymore. Uh, we, are, um, we are peaking out at around 9 billion people is the current projection. In 2050, there won't be any more of us, uh, which means that there will be a limit to how much data we can produce through human input. No matter how small your thumbs are and how fast your teenagers are moving them, they will not be able to send so many text messages that it will be a challenge to store all of them. Today, that is becoming a trivial problem, containing all the phone calls and all the messages that people are sending around the planet is becoming a trivial problem because hardware is developing that fast. It's been developing a lot faster than humanity is. However, there's a new trend out there of not structured data, but data that is being produced by things like cameras, photos. So if you look at big data and you hear this, oh, the, the world is growing by exabytes or petabytes or whatever new unit they're coming up with tomorrow, a lot of that is pictures of cats. YouTube is growing at an enormous speed, and the reason it's growing at an enormous speed, the reason that the size of data in the world is growing so fast is because the type of data we are growing is a different type. It doesn't have the same structure anymore. There's a big difference between handling credit card transactions and handling pictures of cats. And they're very different data domains. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. Take it with a little grain of salt when you hear about how much data there is in the world and how much humanity is producing. Most of it is noise. But there's a lot of jewels when you, when you know how to dig into that. I find this to be a lot more useful definition than it's really big and there's a lot of it, uh, which is that we group big data into three basic categories, volume, velocity, and variety. The first volume is basically the realization that there's a lot of it. And it's being created all the time by humans, by machines that are now generating data faster than human beings are. And we are struggling, quite frankly, to store it all. The growth of hard drive capacity is not keeping up with growth of data anymore. The other thing is that we're becoming increasingly intolerant. We want data faster. We want to analyze it in real time. We want to see it now. There are business drivers for it, and there are social drivers for this. And I'll, I'll talk to a, to a few of those. That is the velocity angle of big data, getting it there fast. It turns out that at the speeds that we need the data and at the speed that it grows, we find a very complex space of performance tuning and a very complex space of hardware configurations that enable us to do this. It's not an easy discipline anymore. And then variety, that's the pictures of cats. Not only is there a lot of it, 
but it's different. It doesn't behave like data used to behave. Credit card transactions are very simple. There's something, there's money that goes out, that money that leaves, that goes in. Phone calls, text messages, these are all simple inputs. We know how to structure them. There are courses in computer science that tell you how to model them. We have data modeling techniques that know exactly how to tune for a lot of these problems. Retailing, for example, is largely a solved problem today. We know how to build a retailing data warehouse and a retailing system. We know we can run it on very small pieces of hardware now if we do things right. This new stuff is different. It doesn't have the same structure. People want to download pictures of Google Maps and they want to do pattern recognition on those pictures and extract data from that. They want to take your social network, analyze how you're connected with your friends, and they want to, to extract data from that. That is the variety angle. This requires new algorithms. This is where the computer science angle is significantly changing. The rest of it is more of the same, really. Today I'll focus on the velocity of data. Some of you may be in the banking industry. You might remember 2008. We had a little bit of a problem there. And one of the problems was that some of these banks had these very complex networks woven into each other through financial instruments. And when this finally crashed, it took a very long time from when we knew it crashed until we knew what the effect was on the market. Even today, it can be argued we don't fully know what, go what happened. Unraveling that net of cause and effect turned out to be a problem that the banks weren't very well equipped to do. So regulations have been put in place. Banks are now being asked to say, if you have a problem, if you are exposed to a company that is going to go bankrupt, we want you to know what your exposure is, and we want you to be able to tell us on a very, very short time frame. And the shorter that time frame is, the more money we will allow you to leverage. This is very attractive for the banks to do, but it's also very attractive for society to be able to track this. So this is good that this regulation is in place. So we're now moving from a space of weeks of knowing what our exposure is, digging through Excel spreadsheets, finding databases all over the network, to consolidating this into a single view of our risk exposure inside banks. We're talking minutes now, not days. But the problem with that is there's a reason that these things took a long time, because the market moves very fast. If you sit there and just listen to the market and just listen at all the ticks that come in and every trade that happens, every hour of the day, with the exception of a few hours over Hawaii when everyone's closed, you will be receiving about 30,000 ticks every second. And you need to do risk analytics on those ticks in real time or near real time. That's where speed suddenly becomes interesting. And when you start adding all of this up and you want a historical perspective on this, you're talking terabytes, hundreds of terabytes of data to get there. So speed is becoming not just do we want to analyze this, but we also want it because we need to act on it very fast. The market is just, it's just increasing in speed. Another place where speed is very important is social media. Who pays for your Facebook page? Well, you do. Not through your credit card, but through the commercials that you're exposed to. These commercials are analyzed for you in real time. When you log into Facebook, your likes and your cookies are analyzed in order to provide you with the best, the most likely experience that will be good for you, that will increase the likelihood that you're going to click on one of those links. There's billions of people on Facebook now. The network alone, the vertexes and the nodes, is even more billion. You have the likes, their connections to each other their connections to what they, what they prefer, their cookies that you know about them, the pictures that they have tagged other people in. All of this comes together to create a profile of you that allows us to target just the thing that you are most likely to buy. Now, this is from this morning, and I'm actually looking into Bitcoin mining because I, I find these types of things that tells you a little bit of how much of a geek I am. But... Um, they actually figured out that I'm probably interested in buying a Bitcoin miner. How do they know that? I don't know. I don't have a like of Bitcoin mining on, on, on Facebook, but apparently they're able to figure this out. To do this, we need compute power. Lots and lots of compute power. Literally, corridors of this. Data centers the size of this building filled up with computers. That's the kind of infrastructure that people run on now. When you run infrastructures of that size, your power consumption becomes a real concern. 
It might not look like a lot that you're plugging in your laptop at home, and that might be consuming, say, 100 watts. If you take an enterprise server with two CPUs in it, you plug that in, you're suddenly looking at 500, maybe 1,000 watts, and we can stack those 20, pile up to each other in about the size of your fridge, and then imagine filling a building this size with that type of compute power. How many watts you consume and how smart you are about how you do things, which ultimately determines how fast you run and how many watts you end up consuming for that speed, is going to matter a lot. And hardware is now evolving in that direction. We are designing hardware that is specifically designed for Facebook's usage because they are now so specialized and they are now so highly optimized that they can start thinking along those lines. So this is a very new world of, uh, of hardware we're looking at. It's a new world of software and it's a new world of opportunity for the people who don't understand how to do this type of mining. We have a customer called Conterra. So this is a smaller installation than Facebook, 100 million page views per day. Today that is still a sizable amount of page views. Um, these people basically serve up these ads and they do so while you click around. They analyze you directly. The way that they have approached this is by open source. This is another interesting trend in the big data space. People are, st are no longer willing to pay for software. If you have 10,000 servers and you're buying them in piles of 10,000, you're not going to be paying a license for those servers anymore. Or you want a really big discount on that license. So you're now running open source. So for those of you interested in that movement, it's gaining a lot of traction because of this big data. Because of the scales that you're operating at, you want to save that. It is now worth it to invest in contributing back to the open source community, giving away software in order for you to save money in your data center. So they run MongoDB. They use NAND storage, and I'll talk a little bit about what that is, SSD, some of you might know the NAND, which basically allows them to go from 100 milliseconds, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's enough for a human being to measure, down to a few milliseconds when they serve up these hits. That's the kind of optimization people are looking at at the moment. Now, how does that affect technology? There's a very big difference between being able to store big data, which actually turns out to be a surprisingly easy problem as long as you are under a certain size, and being able to find what you're looking for again. Storing big data, if you do it right, on a modern hard drive, let's say you go out and buy four terabytes of hard drive about this size, about the size of a matchbox, uh, can be done at about 80 megabytes per second on a single drive. That's a pretty good speed. That's, you know, 10 pictures every second on one hard drive. You have four terabytes of storage, and um, you're typically talking a few cents per gigabyte. Very cheap, very fast. The problem comes when you want to find something again. So instead of storing all these pictures of cats, you now want to find all the ones that are black. To do that, you need to plow through the data. Now, hard drives are very poor at that. They don't seek data very well. If you want to see all of it, they can do that at about the same speed, actually a little faster than 80 megabytes per second. But if what you want to do is jump around in that data and fish out certain pieces from that hard drive, your speed now goes from 80 megabytes to 5 megabytes per second. This is unacceptably slow. This is a single picture every second, to give you an idea of the size of that number. So hard drives are good for storing a lot of data. People are using that a lot today but they're not so good for finding it again. The way that I grew up in computer science and the way that I suspect computer science is still spending a lot of time today is that if you want to find things, you build data structures that help you find it. And there is an enormous amount of research that's still going on on how to do this. It is a field that's constantly evolving. There's good money to be made in that field. Um, and you basically build these data structures that you store in memory on the machine. And you use the CPU to crawl through these data structures in an efficient manner. And depending on what you want to find, you will use different types of data structures. So you store this sort of index of the data, and you then take what you found in that index of the data, and you jump over to the hard drive and fish it out of the hard drive. And that works really, really well. And that has served us very well for the last 50 years. This is the way things went. 
the numbers, the individual rates between these ones have been changing a bit. We're now in the hundreds of millions of operations through an index you can, on a single machine, easily do. Whereas with the hard drives, this number has only gone up very, very little. There's a huge discrepancy between these two. That's one way to solve the problem. Unfortunately, this gives you velocity, but it, isn't, it doesn't give you volume. As the thing over there grows and becomes very large, this thing over here grows with it. Not at the same speed. An index is smaller than the data that you're looking for, but it does grow at a speed that when you move into the big data space becomes restrictive. And you're now suddenly running out of a very expensive resource, the one on the left, namely RAM. So you can add more RAM to a machine. These days, you can go out and you can buy machines that have terabytes of RAM. The problem with that is that the price for memory is not dropping as fast as data is growing. So we plot here. This is the amount of data that we're generating, plotted on a logarithmic scale. And that's the blue line. The red line up there is the amount of, the amount of DRAM you can buy for a dollar. And as you can see, these two have just collided, and this is not likely to get much better. We are going to be continuing to upload more and more pictures of cats, and this is not going to stop. Uh, and we're not, done, we're not done scaling yet. There's still, a, there's still another 2 billion humans to come. So um, this is a losing game. We have to come up with new data center architectures to solve this problem. The way that some of our customers are now solving it is to say, well, there's actually an intermediate technology called NAND Flash, which is what used, it's, it was commoditized by devices such as these. Inside one of these iPhones, you have an NAND Flash device. In a USB stick, you have one of them. They have come down in price a lot. And they're not quite as fast as memory. In fact, they're quite a bit slower than that. But they're quite a bit faster than disk. So they sit in this nice sweet spot in the middle where you can start thinking about these indexing structures. How should we build indexing structures that both allow you to look up in those indexes and keep very large indexes of very large data sizes and at the same time maybe even fetch some of the data out of that? Solving that problem in the middle between the DRAM and the disk. Now, mind you, we're still going to have disks around. Disks are still significantly cheaper than that thing in the middle, especially in the big data solutions. These disks are still, you know, to get you an idea of where we are in the space, this is, you know, pennies per gigabyte. This is pounds per gigabyte. This over here is tens to hundreds of pounds per gigabyte. So we're still going to have disks around for the foreseeable future. Spinning media isn't going to go away. But we're coming up with these new hybrid solutions that mix and match these things up. And computer science is right now with research in this space. So if any of you want to, uh, want to have the next, the next big honors, this is, a, this is a good place to be in. And uh, to give you an idea of what such a data center could look like, uh, I unfortunately cannot give you the name of this particular customer, but this is one of our customer architectures. In the very front, you have web servers. Again, this is a space that's evolving very fast. Web servers are mostly about getting a lot of compute power, a lot of CPUs. And you can cram them very, very tightly today. Compu CPU can basically be crammed into almost no space and make enormous amounts of computation for no money. This is a problem that we have a very good solution to, the way, one at the top there. Underneath there, you have some form of content delivery. What this customer does is that they store the actual content, the pictures of cat, if you will, on traditional hard drives, and they store the indexes, just as I described, on these modern NAND flash devices, which is basically the same thing as, as your iPhone, scaled up to a terabyte, two terabytes of storage instead. Imagine that. And it's about this size. By doing so, they can now get more out of each machine, thereby reducing their machine count and their cooling costs and their power consumption. This hybrid solution turns out to be the sweet spot for this customer. They're mixing and matching those two technologies. Although there are places, namely the login server, which is much, much harder to divide up into some sizable chunks, where you basically need one server to be very, very fast. And for that, they just use the fast technology, including some DRAM. 
So by intelligently combining these technologies with each other, you can, you can create some power profiles and some heating and cooling profiles that are very, very attractive. To give you an idea of what you then typically end up tuning, this over here is what big data is helping us solve. We're getting better at building these things where we can chop things up into multiple servers. This thing over here, like a login server, is something that we actually know pretty well how to solve. But when you start adding a lot of users to a login server, the solutions that you have to do are less tolerant of poor implementation. So one of the things that we, for example, have done, uh, I like to do a lot of performance tuning when I, when I find my, what little spare time I have left now. And um, one of the things is we try to put credit card transactions on a modern server, single machine. And we find that, to give you an idea of if you do things right over here, you can handle all the world's credit card transactions. In 2050, when there's 9 billion of us, and we are assuming that everyone shops like the average teenager does today on one machine. That's how fast hardware has become. And that should give you some idea of the scale that we're now looking at over here in order to create the next revolution in this space. So I hope that today I've given you a little idea of what, we, uh, what we're working on, where this field is going, how hardware is evolving towards this, and more importantly, where computer algorithms and data center architectures are evolving. They are being driven by this trend. So, um, so there's, a, there's a very exciting space to be in at the moment. So I'll be around for questions afterwards. Thank you very much for your time.